Okay, so this session is one of the um, special sessions, and it is on the new frontiers of, and innovations in human dimensions in wildlife research in Africa. And um, we'll have two sessions, one this morning and I believe one this afternoon. And in this session we do have three um, speakers. The speakers have been invited to present their work so we're very, very pleased to have the three speakers that we do. Just to briefly um, say that uh, within the booklet here, it explains much of this, that these presentations will explore how social science theories and methods can help understand and address the challenges and complexities of wildlife, both coexisting with and impacting on humans and natural and human-dominated landscapes in Africa. So this session is Africa specific only. And our first speaker is going to be Professor Melville um, Simon. And he is from the Northwest University in South Africa. And we're very pleased to have you today. Um, and challenges and opportunities in sustainable wildlife management. And we are filming this session. And so where, where would you like the people to stand? Are they here or over here? What you, can do you, you can move around. Okay, thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, program director. Uh, good morning, and I think it's still appropriate to say compliments for the season. Yay. <laughs> okay, it's still morning. <laughs> Some of you have got the jet lag and the rest. Um, right, I will be talking about challenges and uh, opportunities. We're going to, I'm going to highlight some of the, the issues and this paper will deal specifically with the Southern African region, although I'm going to start from a historical perspective looking at Africa. I think before we can even talk about sustainability and how we take things forward, we need to understand the history, where we come from. And I think you will appreciate that despite the attacks that we have on the wildlife industry in terms of hunting and all the rest, you need to appreciate what has happened over the last 40, 50 years in this region. Um, and I think sometimes it's easy for people who are ignorant to make these attacks because they don't understand where we come from. So I think that the facts and the figures and, 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 and the information I'm going to share with you this morning will highlight that. And then uh, for, for a lot of you who are not familiar with this region, I mean the challenges, uh, most probably some of them will sound quite strange, but these are the issues that we need to deal with uh, in, in, in terms of taking this industry forward. The information I'm going to share is basically uh, papers that we've published over the last five to ten years uh, on the issue of uh, wildlife management, a lot of research that we've conducted in national parks uh, in South Africa, a lot of research that we've conducted on private and game farms uh, and nature reserves. Right, so let's start with Africa. What has happened from 1970 to where we are today? And although the media always portrays the success stories in West and East Africa, the figures doesn't support that. Um, if you can look at uh, what's happening in West Africa, uh, the, the number of games since 1970 that we have in national parks, outside of national parks, the same in East Africa, East Africa is doing much better, but then when we look at Southern Africa, Boom! There we have a success story. Uh, and I'm going to start to share this success story with you. Uh, and then we're going to look at the challenges because we still are facing a lot of challenges. Right, so uh, if we look at South Africa and specifically in Namibia as well, we are having quite a lot of success. That is obviously what happened in the earlier parts of the century when people they called it hunting, but it was not hunting, it was culling. Uh, I mean, I read on the, some of the stuff that has been written on historical development, uh, and the number one, or the, the, the person that they reckoned was the most successful hunter in, in, in South Africa, killed over a thousand elephants, over 500 uh, lion, and I'm not talk, even talking about the other species. That's culling, it's not hunting. Um, so we don't want to see that again. Just in terms of South Africa, a bit of background on, 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 on the conservation side. 
Our first National Parks Act was established uh, in 1926, which led to the establishment of the Kruger National Park officially, um, also in the same period. And in the 1960s, a lot of people are not aware of that hunting was allowed in Kruger National Park. Whilst today, it's not allowed to hunt in any of the national parks in South Africa. But people had to pay. And because of that, the private sector realized that there is money to be made. So you can also see why game farms started in, in the 1960s in South Africa. Today, and I'm proud to say we have the largest privately owned wildlife industry in the world, um, which I think is part of our success story. Now, just some growth figures. Again, I want to highlight the fact that if there was not an intervention that we had, this picture would have looked totally different to what it looked then. These are the figures in 1960 of some of the species and the number of game, uh, the guesstimates at that stage and where we are today. Here you can see Bontebok, which was nearly uh, extinct. Today we're doing quite well with it. Um, and, 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 and a lot of the others. So we had like 540,000 and today the, the figures range between 20 and 30, uh, uh, 23 million. So there is a success or something to, to talk about. Today we are experiencing or we're having more gain than in the past 200 years in South Africa. Um, and one of the reasons why we're having this success is because of this. The private sector got involved. Unfortunately, government doesn't have the funds um, and I think sometimes also the know-how to, to sustain what, um, what we need to sustain because the priorities are, keep, uh, are changing. Right, so why did it work in the previous uh, part of the century? Game had no monetary value and I know that the, the, the North American model differs but that's North America. You don't have the issues that we are dealing with and you will see when, when you talk about the challenges. So you can't have the same model for, the, for, for, for all parts of the world. Um, we have to differentiate. So game had no monetary value. If I'm going too fast, please just tell me because I've got a lot of slides and I've got a lot of stuff to talk about um, and I want to get through my presentation and I'm keeping my back to the, <laughs> to the program. <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Um, Undesirable game was seen as undesirable competitors for grazing. A game because of ignorance. Remember, you've got different species and they eat different stuff. So, and the absence of game meant that your farm or your area actually in value had a higher value than an area where the, the game was present because it was seen as competition. And the last thing. And this was also a problem, is that anyone could hunt anywhere. Um, so there's no control. And that's why you have the photo that, and I mean, there are many other photos similar to the one that I showed you. So those are the reasons why it didn't work in the previous uh, century. Now, just talking about sustainability, and I'm just going to touch on this uh, quickly. I mean, we all know what sustainability is all about. But I think sometimes this is a word used um, but I think it's a much more complex issue than to say, well, we want to uh, keep what we have here and even improve what we have so that the future generations can see this. And then we come up with this really, very really nice model and we say, once those three things are in balance, everything is on Midori. But I think it's much more complex than that. Because there are so many role plays that influences these relationships um, that it's not as simple as just trying to achieve those things. What we've done in terms of national parks, from a socio-economic uh, research point of view, uh, we've developed this very simple model, um, but it works. Uh, and we've done socio-economic studies for quite a large number of national parks in South Africa, um, where you have the national park, and obviously the tourist is a key role player because they spend money and they visit the park. But businesses also play a, 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 an important role, as well as NGOs and the community. And this is the one part where we have not done very well, um, is in terms of community. And you'll see later, in terms of the challenges, why 
the, the, the fact that we failed this part and, and the influence of that. So this is an issue that, that, that you need to deal with when it comes to sustainability and when it comes to socioeconomic impact, the community plays an enormous important role. Is everyone still okay? Quiet. Right, now in general, game farms have several revenue streams. And again, you need to understand this um, because it impacts on, on the challenges. Um, first one there, and they're not in, 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 in any order of preference or, or, or importance. First one there is ecotourism. Ecotourism is an important role player, although from an economic point of view, we have not really quantified the contribution of most of the figures that you will see that people come up with with in terms of ecotourism is most probably thumbs up because very little work has been done in this area. Um, we've been trying to, to do that, but it's not as easy as people think it is. The second um, area or pillar that generates revenue for game farms and even for national parks is breeding. Um, and uh, I mean, you are familiar with, with what is happening in terms of breeding. Uh, but there are also a few challenges. The third one, which is underutilized, which offers huge opportunity, uh, is processed green game products. So people hunt when they do this, but what do you do with the meat, what do you do with the skins and the horns and all those things? It has huge potential. Again, I will touch on this later. The one that's most probably the largest source of income uh, and uh, stream of income for, for uh, game farms in southern Africa is hunting. Um, whether it's local people or whether it's trophy hunting, and in the session after lunch, uh, we will also be doing a pro uh, presentation on research that we've done on trophy hunting in southern Africa uh, and the income generated by that. And a new one is investment. This is an interesting one uh, where people who do not necessarily own a game farm invest either in terms of game, uh, where you can invest in game, uh, or in terms of infrastructure. So this is a, an interesting one. And, and the reason is that people just kind of like expand their, 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 their uh, portfolio uh, of investments by looking at game farms as another area of investment. Right. So what are the challenges? And by luck it worked out that they are in terms of, once I did all the, the um, challenges, I wrote them down. Uh, it worked out to, to, be a, to be seven, and the interesting thing is that they all start with a P. And that was just, it wasn't planned like that, but it worked out like that. Our first and, and a serious challenge in the region remains poverty. As long as you have poverty, you have a challenge. Um, and, and one of the other kind of like effects of Poverty is the one that I think a lot of papers will be dealing with over these next few days, uh, is poaching. That's one of the reasons why people poach. Because by killing one rhino in a national park or on a game farm, they most probably earn more than they would have done in two, three, four years uh, in terms of doing other jobs. So it's worthwhile for people to do that. And as long as we don't address poverty, we are going to have a problem with poaching. And we've seen it. It's increasing, um, and it's costing us billions to, to try and maintain this issue. And it moves from rhino to lions, and it's, it just keeps on going. Um, so the, 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 the whole poaching effect is escalating. Here you can see some photos um, of, of what poachers do. And I mean, that's in another part of Africa. Um, and here you can also see the new form of poachers and how technolog technologically advanced they are. It's not just a, a, an idiot that runs around in a private game reserve or in a, in a national park trying to kill it. These are well-organized people. Uh, they use technology, they understand what has to happen. Um, right, so the third one, politics and, politi uh, politics and policies. Um, in Southern Africa, politics determines a lot of stuff, uh, very much so. I mean, Americans can, you can echo, you are also experiencing some of the things that we are experiencing in South, Af South Africa and South Africa. Um, so whatever the, the government of the day decides, whether it's good or bad, has an influence. 
I mean, and I don't want to talk about America, but I think that one of the things that Trump is doing incorrectly is in terms of his environmental policies. Uh, and we have similar issues in terms of wildlife management in, in Southern Africa that influences not only sustainability, but the future um, of the way we are dealing with wildlife. This is another beauty. I think you're all familiar with the publicity, specifically on hunting. Um, and just the other day, while I was doing channel hopping, there was this um, cartoon. And the one thing that struck me is that I've never seen a cartoon where you have a hunter that has been portrayed as a happy and a nice person. Never. It's always the biggest guy, the meanest guy with the biggest gun. And have you ever seen how they move? This guy was moving like this. And no hunter moves like that. You know? So I sat there and I thought, this is one of the reasons why we have this problem. Because people get this image. Even when you're small and you have a little Bambi movie. And I understand that. I mean, even I want to cry. You see the Bambi movie, the little animal, and the tears, and the beautiful eyes, and the smile, and then you see the mean hunter behind the bush. And if it is, we don't like these guys. But in Southern Africa, these guys have a huge role to play in order to address that. Because if we don't address this, we won't have game left in this part of the world. That's the bottom line. There's just not enough money to maintain it. Uh, people, and under people I have a few, few issues. The first one, community is crucial for us. Communities need to understand why we have them, why conservation is there, how can they be involved in conservation, how can they generate income from conservation. Tourists, tourist needs are changing. Uh, I mean, the tourist of today is different than the tourist of 15, 20, 30 years ago. Their travel patterns, their travel behavior is different which then means that employees and the way we develop their skills needs to change as well. So it has an impact on people from different points of view. Again, it impacts on your sustainability, all three of those issues. Number six, partnerships. This is a huge problem. Um, and, and specifically the lack of partnerships amongst organizations. We've got NGOs who are fighting for the same battle, but they have different ideas. There's no consensus. And in fact, eventually they fight against each other. Uh, which to me makes no sense. I mean, if we all agree that we need to maintain wildlife, I always make, my view is, then we get everyone in the room. Whether you agree with the method or not, and we talk about it and we come back with some form of something that works for most of us. You will never be able to, 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 to satisfy everyone but at least you will be able to satisfy most. Um, and and some, somehow we, we just don't get that right. So this remains a, a problem. And we've seen now in South Africa that one of the major organizations has been split into two because of a different, a very, very simple different view on a very simple issue. Um, and the, the last one, position of wildlife industry on key issues. Again, it goes back to number six, where we need to get some form of consensus. To cons uh, con where we need to get some consensus. I had the word as I was saying it, it just kind of like disappeared. Where we have to have consensus in terms of how are we going to take conservation forward? We've done well. Remember, this is a very, very young industry. We've done well up to now. The question is, what are we going to do differently for the next 40, 50 years? How are we going to deal with this? There are issues of color variance in, in Southern Africa, which is a big issue and a lot of debate. The issue of hunting of lions. And they, I mean, this is not only an iconic species, but somehow it's a sacred species. You can kill and hunt any species, and most people will not have much to say about it. But the moment we talk about lions, Boy, this is a different thing. Then 19 comes back into the picture. You know? And then we've got a, that's a different, totally different debate. Um, but again, we need to talk about that. How are we going to do that? 
And remember, we can't forget that we have high unemployment, we've got poverty, and we need to take all these decisions in relation to those problems. Five minutes. Five minutes, I'm doing very well, thank you. Or less. <laughs> okay. Opportunities. What are the key opportunities? I think that they, from, uh, from an entrepreneurial uh, point of view, this industry offers huge, huge, huge opportunities. And even in the university courses that we involved in and that I've seen from many other universities, very little is being or has been set on the issue of entrepreneurial development and wildlife management. I think that this is something that we need to address in the next couple of years. Ecotourism, we know it's there, we know it's underdeveloped, uh, we know it has huge potential. Um, so, again, something that we can improve on. Game meat. Now, luckily in South Africa, the legislation is changing, which means that I think that it will become easier for game farmers to sell game meat, uh, which was difficult up to now. And I think this is going to change the game changer. Again, but again it brings into, in, in, into debate how we're going to do conservation forward because we don't all want game farms to, to go into these little small holdings where you have animals that are bred like cattle um, because I think that's not the way to do it. Um, so it offers opportunities but it also can become a bit of a threat if we don't manage it well. It has huge investment opportunities in this field and even in South Africa the government understands this um, and is starting to, um, to, 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 uh, to put money into this part. I think this is a huge, huge opportunity again, the issue of agri-tourism because eventually game farms fall into, under the, the um, field of um, farming or agriculture uh, and agri-tourism is starting to, to become a, an issue and agri-tourism is starting to to be promoted, although a lot of people don't still don't understand it. And we've seen some of the mega farmers in South Africa who are commercial farmers are starting to invest in the wildlife industry as well. Again, it offers us huge opportunities. So they bring your normal cattle and game together. And it used to be like that 100 years back in any case. So it's not nothing, it's not something new. One minute. One minute. Okay. Uh, create, creation of job opportunities. This to me is very close to my heart and the issue of poverty alleviation. I mean, I keep on emphasizing it, but if we don't do something about this, uh, we're going to fall into the trap like the rest of Africa, where a lot of the game has just been decimated. And we don't want that. Uh, just one or two lessons learned. From an economic point of view, the multiplier plays an important role. So you have to have all those linkages in the value chain. We've got to try and keep as much money in an area as possible. This is a problem in South Africa where a lot of the operators are not based in this country, so a lot of money just flows back out of the country. Um, so that is, I think, an issue that we need to, to, to look at. Tourism and the economic sectors, I'm not going to talk too much about it. I think it's an important issue, but it has to do with Tourism vis-a-vis -vis other industries, because a lot of people in this field say, well, tourism, that's the answer. I'm very much into tourism and all my research is in tourism, but I still maintain that we've got to have a differentiated or diverse, the diversified economy, uh, rather than just one that, that's just based on, on tourism or just on wildlife. I think it's dangerous. The level of development of game farms, the level of development of national parks is crucial from an, an income point of view. We found that those that are more developed in terms of accommodation, restaurants, and what they offer are by far more sustainable, and the socio-economic footprint is much, much bigger. Okay, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I think my time is up. And, uh, so, thank you.